One of the discussions, interesting discussions about markets is their relationship to physical place. That we talk about going to the market, we understand that, of course, it means something very specific. We go to the Asaichi or the Ichiba, for example. And we see some hints in our language everywhere um, that relate to the physical market. People had to come together physically in the past, of, of course, not just to exchange goods, but even, even things that uh, were maybe knowledge-based required a physical place. In a sense, the transaction that is in a university education up until uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has very much been tied to a physical place as well. Now, this physical place to meet also presented opportunities for governments to actually tax business. One of the interesting things we see is that when governments organise a physical place for a market, it also presents an opportunity to raise money. So to simply get into the marketplace in the first place, you need permission, and the government can tax you right there. Uh, Ginza, we all know Ginza, of course. It's uh, the most prestigious real estate uh, shopping precinct in Tokyo. Aoyama's catching up, but anyway. Uh, so, of course, Ginza was Silver Place. This was a um, major financial center in the Edo period. This is where effectively the uh, financiers of the day, in an era when uh, silver was the standard currency, it was the reserve currency, unlike the gold standard, which existed in the uh, Anglo-American world, for example, that you actually had a silver standard in Japan. And so the Ginza, was the silver market. And significantly, to have a za, to have a place, literally a seat in the market, uh, you had to be admitted to the Traders Association and you had to pay a tax for it. Still today, uh, the uh, admission into markets is heavily regulated. You cannot just put your hand up and say, I want to be a seafood trader in uh, the Tokyo fish market, or any of the regional fish markets, for example, in, say, Kikatsura, Nachikatsura, uh, which is a major port for landing um, maguro, kajigi maguro, so, you know, tuna and swordfish, um, you can't freely buy and sell in that market. You have to be pre-approved to do this. This presents business opportunities or excludes you from business opportunities if you can't participate in that market. So the physical place historically was required by the nature of the product, but also made it much easier to enforce oligopoly, so effectively price controls through controlling members, and also allowed governments very easily to tax business. Uh, if you travel in many parts of the world, you'll see some of the grandest buildings in cities are called customs houses. This is uh, where typically ships would come up the river or into the port and they would offload product and the government would control the, uh, the flow of goods into the city. And that was where they could raise taxes. Now, coming together in one place has enormous efficiencies. Sharing of information, uh, allowing customers, for example, to do comparisons, and we still see this in completely free markets, that uh, businesses tend to cluster in similar locations. Uh, in so many places in the world, if you want to go and see about buying a car, uh, many of the car dealers are all lined up along the same highway, so you can start at one end of the street and go to the other end of the street. Uh, we see this, for example, in Tokyo, if you're interested in buying furniture. Um, if you go down to Meguro, there is a kind of a Meguro Kagu kind of road, interior road, uh, where you can walk along a street um, heading towards Daikanyama and go to several dozen interior and furniture stores. So it's more efficient from a customer's uh, point of view. And we've seen this uh, throughout history. But that's only a one aspect of this efficiency from a common place. There are so many other aspects of efficiency. 
common currency, common standards, for example. Now, Japan had common standards from quite an early on, uh, early on in its history. If we look at the measures, for example, for width of fabric, it's referred to as a shaku. And if you look at the structure of a kimono, it's a standard width of fabric, uh, which also relates to the width of uh, wide obi as well, but particularly the, the individual panels of fabric. By making that standardised, then it simply became a question of the length of the fabric and the quality of the fabric. So you've got common elements there. Tatami, of course. Japan is striking in this respect. And indeed, it was the standard tatami and the modularization of the traditional Japanese house that had a huge impact on architects in Europe and the United States, people like Walter Gropius, who founded and headed the Bauhaus, for example, um, and in his 70s came to Japan for the first time, were fascinated by Japanese historical, traditional standardization, um, modularization, that it allowed uh, the Japanese traditional housing practices to be reduced to a series of modules uh, which effectively could be sem assembled. If you think about this, the shoji, the, the tatami, for example, uh, the fusuma, all of these elements um, had effectively a degree of commonality. commonality. Now, great variance in quality, of course, but when you hold some elements um, constant, then it becomes so much easier to coordinate uh, business. Of course, standard weights and measures. The Romans developed this, and uh, we still have the, uh, the legacy of that. Um, Napoleonic France then codified um, rather more precisely a lot of these, and uh, we have them in our language today, you know, the kilogram, the milligram, you know, the centimeter, the meter, for example. And in a lot of countries, uh, the historical system, standard system for measurement, has often stayed on in relation to things like um, land. So we see in Israel the measurement system for land, which was run by the Ottoman Turks when Israel was part of the Ottoman Empire, carried through to the British Mandate period, and then after the State of Israel was created, they still used the same land measures partly because records and legal documents have been written in those terms. So there is what we call path dependency. It's often quite difficult to change systems and change standards once they're adopted because so many people depend on them. Um, when I was a kid, I remember that Australia switched from imperial to metric. Uh, they went over from um, inches and feet to centimetres and metres, but still some things are still measured in the old inches. And we, we still see this. Um, televisions in Japan even are measured in terms of inches, although I think no one in Japan um, has any kind of working memory of doing anything in uh, the old imperial system. Remember that even imperial is not standard. There's actually um, um, the American system and the British system was slightly different. Having worked as a photographer when I was a university student, I knew, I knew this. You had to look at American versus British quartz, for example, if you're measuring out uh, things. But the critical thing is that the stakeholders know what the common standard is and can work with it. By the way, the first car I had, um, the speedometer only showed miles. Uh, they didn't show it in kilometers. I was once, once stopped by a policeman and tried to convince him that um, what I was doing was actually right in terms of the speed limit. And he had zero sympathy whatsoever. He told me that was my problem and that um, I should buy a newer car so that I knew that I was sticking to the speed limit. So the common standards help to reduce what we call transaction costs. Transaction costs are a key concept in business and economics, and we'll talk further about it. Another very important part of common standards is 
in terms of basic legal practices, in terms of writing contracts, it would be just so much more complicated doing business if every contract was original, not least the trouble of writing the things, of actually interpreting it. For example, in many countries now, if you buy an apartment, you buy a house, it's a standard form contract. And what that means is that without paying much attention to the contractual details, you can commit to a hugely expensive transaction, the most expensive thing you will ever buy in your life, um, because you know it's a standard contract. Your real estate agent, anyone else is advising you, um, knows what's in a contract and can warn you on the uh, particular issues. Of course, if a dispute does arise, the very fact that courts exist becomes another critical part of this. Despite all of this, despite legal systems and whatnot, trust is still absolutely vital. Reputation, mutual reputation for, for being reliable. Because what's very clear is if you do end up in a legal fight in business, the beneficiaries usually are your lawyers. It's the lawyers who benefit from the conflicts that arise from others. Now, sometimes you still have to fight that fight. You have to go out there, you have to sue people. Um, hopefully you never have to. I have never had to do it, thankfully. Um, academics tend not to get into these kind of fights. Um, it does help that I have a cousin who's a lawyer, though. I, I always think he could, if need be, I could um, ask him to send a scary lawyer's letter on my behalf. I haven't had to do anything like that yet. Uh, people actively involved in business, they have a lawyer on standby. Um, they have them on speed dial, the old, the old expression, uh, to constantly advise them on legal issues. It's just much better to work with people you trust, though, so that you never get into those kind of conflicts in the first place. When business tends to be concentrated in small communities or physically clustered communities where people can interact face to face, trust becomes ever more potent. Silicon Valley, certainly Hollywood, for example. As I said in an earlier uh, session, that the old Hollywood expression, you'll never work in this town again. The best guarantee in Hollywood of people doing a good job is their concern for their own reputation, much less a fear about being sued. So the implication here is, and I say this in the slides, that people develop their reputational capital. This is a key notion, reputational capital. And of course, information about dodgy, the cheats, the incompetent, all become really important. I had in, in our first, first class, uh, in the slide, what I call the daily dodgy, one of my favorite stories about some scoundrels, some ratbags, some really dodgy guys um, up in Hokkaido who, and they must have been drunk to realize this, suddenly occurred to them that if you shaved a sheep in a certain way, it kind of looks like a poodle to people who don't know poodles very well. And poodles are very expensive dogs in Japan. So somehow they got some sheep, maybe they imported them, shaved them and then sold sheep as poodles to unsuspecting customers. I almost respect them for their shamelessness, for their cheek. There's a, there's a Yiddish expression, a, um, an old Jewish expression, chutzpah, um, a kind of a bold shamelessness to actually sell a um, sheep as a poodle. By the way, they got caught out eventually because some uh, celebrity took her poodle to the vet and said that the uh, poodle would not eat dog food but did seem to like grass, and this was a bit strange. And of course, the vet looked and laughed and said, uh, likes grass because it's a sheep, okay? Not a poodle. So they kind of, those guys did get caught out. Um, reputation, I mean, if you, if you look to buy things online, you see this, uh, word of mouth becomes um, absolutely um, important. I think we all understand this. So we build our reputation, and that reputation is easily damaged, but is only very slowly cultivated. So it does create powerful incentives for people to engage in good practice. 
There are some conditions when people won't do that, when they will cheat, that it's one shot, that they'll rip you off because they think they will never see you again. The implication, of course, is that you're most vulnerable um, when you're traveling, uh, precisely because the chances are that you will um, not be back to give them a hard time about something bad that uh, people have sold to you. So especially if you're out of town, act like you're a local or act like you just moved or act like you have local friends. Fortunately, digital communications gives us some recompense. Hotels have become so much better to stay in in the last 10 years because of online booking sites. Uh, these days, hotels live or die by their reviews on booking.com or Expedia or whatever. So this has really turned everyone into a local um, in a funny kind of way where you're digitally connected. You can powerfully inflict reputational damage on businesses that don't meet uh, good standards of conduct. On the other side, of course, uh, you can be very unfairly maligned by someone who writes an unfair review. And that's one of the really significant ongoing issues and something we'll come back to later on uh, when, in the course when we talk about managing reputation.